and I'll give you my very cheeky answer to that. The American will meet you and say, oh my God, you speak so good English or such good English. And my response now typically is yours is not too bad either. <laughs> and because actually, you know, they were colonized the same way we were colonized. So, but, uh, but more seriously, they say, why do Indians do so well? Super thrilled and honored to be hosting this OG Indian entrepreneur, Deep Kalra at the Masters Union campus today. Deep is the founder and the group chairman for Make My Trip Group. Make My Trip Group has Make My Trip, Go Ibibo, Red Bus, all of these A-lister brands under its umbrella. Deep, you started in 2000 when startups were not known how to run them, how do you raise funding, and definitely no role models to tell you how do you go and actually list your startup uh, for an IPO at NASDAQ, a dream that a lot of entrepreneurs even today just aspire for. Fun fact for the audience is that Make My Trip actually started uh, serving the US Indian customers and launched in India only in 2005, five years after its foundation. So Deep, we are thrilled to have you. Thank you so much for making the time and welcome to the campus. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks, Mehek. Thanks, everyone. I have to be honest, I'm still recovering from uh, what I've just seen. So Pratham uh, gave me a tour of your campus and I'm blown away, literally. I think it's fantastic. I'd heard things about it. Uh, interestingly, till a few months ago, I had only vaguely heard of Masters Union. And then within the last six months, a couple of young students, their parents approached me and they said, what do you know about this place? I said, very little, but let me find out. So I asked my CHRO and uh, Yuvraj, who was going to be here, but he had uh, to go for some uh, other work. Uh, he had very good things to say. I think two of my colleagues are here. Are you guys here wasting your time? Yeah, okay. Oh yeah, Yash is right here. Okay, hi, both of you are here. I told him, please don't send anyone. They know all of this, but he said no. So I heard very good things from a head of HR, which is important. And uh, now I know why. And uh, you mentioned no role models. And you had one of my biggest role models here last week or yesterday, Sanjeev. Sanjeev came last week. Yeah. Uh, so all for your convocation. Yes. So, you know, the, I did have a role model even way back then, uh, including great. others. But yeah, uh, you know, firstly, congratulations, uh, Pratham, to you and to all of you who put this together, the founding team, everyone. It's really fantastic. And I have no doubt just I think we spent I was here, what, 10 to 3, maybe we spent 20, 30 minutes together. I have no doubt that you're going to build something super special. So I'm, And I don't just say it. I, I can feel it. So I, I, really, I, I really think you, you have all the founding blocks in place. Uh, I think your vision is very clear and it's ambitious as it should be. And I see no reason you won't achieve whether breaking into top 10 and even beyond. And you know, really, I, I think in the process, you're going to put India on the map. So I'm very excited about that because it's something very nice to see India, Gurgaon, uh, you know, someone from India do so well. And uh, really, uh, you know, I think there's no dearth of demand. Uh, it's just that quality supply has always been our bane in education. That's been, you know, that's sadly what, you know, India's story, because when we meet foreigners from overseas and people love to say, Hey, how come Indians, the first thing they'll love to tell you, and I'll give you my very cheeky answer to that, is American will meet you and say, oh my God, you speak so good English, or such good English, and my response now typically is, yours is not too bad either. <laughs> and because actually, you know, they were colonized the same way we were colonized. So, but, uh, but more seriously, they say, why do Indians do so well mm. uh, overseas and everywhere? Like in Fortune 100, now we have probably, I think, 10 CEOs or 20 CEOs in Fortune mm. 200 or whatever. And the reason is that our education system is so rigorous, so hard that we have, you know, beaten up metal and beaten up gold to make it ready for anything. But it's not there at scale. And I think LPU, uh, rather I should say Masters Union is looking to change that. And I think you will, which is to do this at scale. Uh, so each one of you students who are here is actually privileged. Uh, again, I don't say this very often. I think I last said this at uh, probably Ashoka or at I'm Ahmedabad, but not too many other places. So you're very privileged and lucky to be here. And being in a founding batch, being in the early days, there's something very special about that too. You'll feel a sense of connect. You'll be actually part of the process. I saw Pratham chat casually with a couple of students in the elevator, asking them about you know their living conditions, their cleaning conditions. That's so nice. That won't happen after five to ten years. That's <laughs> that, it won't because there'll be just such a large scale. But uh, so you know, consider yourself privileged. But more importantly, 
please make the most of this opportunity. Uh, it doesn't come often. When I look back and I look back at my undergrad days or my postgrad days, especially my undergrad days, I really wish I had spent, invested more time and mind space into it. And I would have got more. I probably didn't do enough. Postgrad, I think I, I did a fair deal. So, you know, the more you put in, the more you'll get out of it. Clearly, MU is a place which wants to give more. It's up to you how much you want to take. And that's what it is about business education. So, sorry not to answer your question and to take it away. But now over to you, whatever you want to know. Thank you for uh, saying such kind words, especially coming from someone like you who's on the Ashoka's founding team and then, you know, uh, an alumnus of IMA himself. I think it really means a lot to us. Uh, my first question, which was actually low, uh, way below in my question list, but I'll start with that, is that today if you look at the trade deficit of the country, uh, education, higher education actually makes up 10% of that. And I was looking at your podcast with Raj Shumani, where you mentioned that it is the golden decades of India. We have 5G sorted, we have 120 crores uh, internet users, we have uh, 2,000 uh, per capita income, etc., etc., and we're sure that students will come back. But what is missing in the education system, which is not letting us keep our students here, and we're not able to attract international talent to come and study in India? Well, clearly, I think I touched upon that. I think it's scale, firstly. Hmm. Uh, we just don't have enough high-quality uh, institutes or colleges. Hmm. We have some, and then it, it's a pyramid. So we, on the top, we have, I think, the world's best. Uh, and then it, there's a very, very deep chasm. It just falls off uh, because those were set up with investments which were very often made by the government. Right. Ashoka is a new kind of model. It's the largest group philanthropy project which has happened in the longest time, I wow. think, probably in India. It's a very unique model and it takes someone like Ashish Dhawan Sanjeev to have that vision to set that up. But, uh, you know, something like this, I haven't seen for a while. This is reminding me of... Uh, Possibly, and I haven't even been to Flame, but I believe Flame's doing a very good job in, in Pune. Mm. Um, you know, there are very few and far between. I think when Symbiosis would have come up earlier, it would have been something like this. And Symbi has done a good job. Manipal's yeah. done a good job. But that's it. You have to count them beyond the IITs and the IIMs mm. and all. DU has stagnated. Right. And one of the reasons Ashoka has come up is that DU, Delhi University, which, you know, has such fantastic colleges, and I'm very proud to be from St. Stephen's. My wife's from LSR. The curriculum has not changed much mm. in, you know, I passed out in 90 and the curriculum has changed a bit, but right. it should have changed dramatically because business has changed dramatically, mm. economics has changed dramatically. But if you're not alive with the time and you're not nimble, so I think one reason is just scale mm. and quality. So they go hand in hand. Right. So where will people go? And the third thing what has happened is affordability. So trickle down, uh, you know, theory has worked. A lot of household incomes have obviously, uh, you know, quadrupled and even more. And, uh, you know, I use my reference point when I passed out of school and I went to a very good school in Delhi called St. Columbus, which was a, you know, very good egalitarian kind of school. Very few people from my batch went overseas to study for their undergrad. And the five or six who went for their undergrad, hmm. the five or six who went were from super rich business families because they were the only right. ones who could afford it or who had the vision or whatever you can call it. Actually, it came down to affordability. Everyone else found their place in India. And today, if I look at my kids who passed out, my kids are now 23 and 21 or 23 and 22 actually now as of last week. So, and they went to Sriram school in Gurgaon. I think uh, probably more than half their batch. Actually, I meant to ask uh, this question of uh, uh, Sriram. I should know it. I'm on, I'm on the managing committee of TSRS. <laughs> But I think it's more than 50%, which is going overseas to study. Wow. It's sad, right? It's... Because the ones who are going to top schools, great. But why is everyone else going? Because they're not getting good, you know, places to go to out here. Mm. And the affordability is there. So all these factors are playing a role. And mm. people are going, we have to stem that, at least where people are not going to a top 20 school. Mm. Why should they go out? They're better exactly. off here. Right. But it's cooler, it's easier. You know, youngsters who have, they know the affordability is there. I don't want to put down Australia or Canada. Well, Canada has some good colleges. I'm not sure Australia has any college which is better than, uh, you know, most of the Indian colleges. But people go to Australia. I could be wrong. I'm not that close to it. Maybe one, maybe two. Canada, a couple. Yeah, sure. I think UOT is fantastic. It's like right up there and UBC is very good. But beyond that, why? US top 20, top 30, maybe top 40. UK, five colleges or three and a half colleges which are really... People should be vying to go to. Why are they going to the others? A lot of them are party schools. 
and I don't want to put that down. I know what happens. I've seen it through the eyes of my kids, friends, etc. So I think uh, we need uh, MU to be on steroids, and and you guys need to do. And we need, you know, the beauty about something different being done and something unique being done is India is very entrepreneurial. Others are watching and others are doing. And I remember this being said by Ashish Dhawan, who you should get at some point of time at Ashoka. I would love Ashoka to spawn a hundred more Ashokas. Absolutely. And, but we don't have to do them ourselves. Someone else should do it because it's needed for the country. And whoever does it well will reap the harvest too. So I think that's really the, the reason. The no, absolutely. Yeah. And I think you touched on some very important points. Uh, what I see around in institutes is that a lot of them have optimized for intake. Uh, yeah. That you try to just get the cream in yeah. and cream out sort of things. So so again, I didn't know Raj Shimani till I did that interview. Two yeah. weeks before that, my PR person said we should do this interview. I said, right. who is this guy? <laughs> what worries me is that more people, yeah, clearly I'm of a different <laughs> age. Clear, uh, and my, my uh, head of uh, comms, he told me, I promise you, and I hate doing uh, interviews. I think it's a waste of time. And he said, I promise you, I'll trade this off for 10 interviews with business journals. Wow. I said, okay, then it's worth doing that one hour if you're going to trade it off. The worrying thing is that that has more popularity than everything else put together. So suddenly my barber knew me. Yeah. So my barber said, sir, aapka podcast dekha. And I said, really? Wow. And then people, I don't even want to tell the kind of people who knew me after Raj Shapani. Right. So I told him, I said, Raj, you're clearly very famous. Right. And you have perfected the art of making bits and pieces and bites and sound bites. Right. And that's that's his job. So hats off to him. He's an entrepreneur too. And you yes. should get him here sometime. Very bright. Yeah. Very, very bright. Yeah, I okay. hope this interview is going to be worth your time, so I'm going to ask good questions. I'm already very happy coming here, so I, I'm, I'm very, you've made it worth my while coming here. Yeah, Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. So my next question to you, Deep, is that you are someone who's built an empire which is doing almost a, a little more than half a billion dollar of revenue yearly. And how does someone like you spend their time, maybe a day or a week in life of Deep Kalra, and how has that changed over the years? Yeah, eyes are set actually on a billion now. We're <laughs> 660 sure. and going pretty fast. And mm -hmm. frankly, if COVID didn't happen, you can imagine sure. what COVID did to travel, right? Yes. So uh, we had an earnings call and all of you know the stock market and you know NASDAQ. I saw the live uh, ticker out there, which is cool. So an earnings call of the first quarter in national lockdown, uh, I had the unenviable job of, of reporting uh, 95 point, 96% drop in revenues. Oh my God. We were obliterated because of national lockdown. There was no, in right. fact, one investor very smartly asked me, so where did 4% come from? And that was really <laughs> the emergency stays and you know what people, emergency travel, but it was terrible. And I think in a very weird sort of way, now I can look back, I think that was actually uh, a really good thing for uh, mm. to happen. Just like the other shocks that had happened in the past, 2008 was very good for us in hindsight because the better companies not only do they survive, they figure out a way to thrive. Mm. And what it does is it pushes you to the corner. Mm. And I'm sure all of you who have seen this personally and or who have seen it through the eyes of others, uh, I'm sure, sir, you would have seen uh, you know moments like this. The tough moments push you to a corner and force you to take very tough decisions. And obviously we had to cut costs, but you can't cut costs overnight. I mean, we started cutting costs and literally everything, but the toughest and the hardest thing to cut is people, yes. right? And you don't want to do that. And I think we took a lot of pride in never ever having to do layoffs till COVID came. And finally, six months into COVID, we said, we don't have a choice. Mm. We let go of 10% of our workforce. Mm. And in 23 years of Make My Trips history, it's the, the most, not the worst decision, but the toughest and the most distasteful decision. I, I still think about it and I feel really sad and bad. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Rajesh, who's my co-founder, who's now group CEO, and I've gone, uh, well, partial executive. I tried to go non-executive pre-COVID, didn't mm -hmm. happen. But I'm partial executive by choice. And both of us say that was the saddest. So we still try, we try to help everyone personally. Whoever had done five years with us or 10 years with us, we help them personally. We try to get jobs, which was obviously a tough thing to do for those with only with travel needs. But we've also tried to get a lot of them back. Right. So, in fact, Yash, who's sitting out here, does my immersion for me every month. For everyone, he does it. And our immersion is new joinees. And we, I've designed that program personally. They do one week in the whole uh, system. I, for one week, they're just immersing themselves through the eyes of leaders and other people. 
And when we do this, I see in every immersion batch, 40, 50, 60, sometimes 70 people every month joining, we have so many returnees and I'm like wondering what was going on and then, you know, you shared with me, Yuvraj shared with me that these are actually people, we want them to come back. So we're trying, but it's a very tough thing. Mm. But it makes you address all the other frivolous costs. So a lot of fixed costs which are there, uh, space included, uh, and therefore your asset light model is super smart. Uh, keep it asset light always. Uh, marketing is the easiest to cut. What we don't conveniently think about is every time we cut marketing costs, someone else also might lose their job down the line. Mm -hmm. It's not just media, right? There was someone who was a media planner, there was someone else. So it had a cascading effect, but it made us tougher. It also made us, you know, take some silent vows of what we will not ever do again. Right. And so I think that helped us a lot. So if you really see the story of pre-COVID to just now, I think last quarter post-COVID, we moved from minus 70 million, I'm saying it in million, but you guys will do the math pretty, like basically 600 crore minus mm. to 600 crore plus. So a swing of 1200 crores happened in this two and a half, three year period at the bottom line. And that was the game changer. It would not have happened if we weren't pushed to the corner. We would have been happily fat that, you know, the swing would have probably come to, I mean, it would have been minus 20, minus 30. We were moved to plus 20, plus 30, been happy. Market would have been sort of happy. Now the market's delighted. For three quarters, the market didn't give us what we deserved for a very simple reason. They were like saying, is this real? Is this sustainable? The market wants to see sustainability. This last quarter, we got the full reward. And the stock really, I think, is now much closer to where it should be. I still think, like all entrepreneurs, it can be better. But it took a while. It, we really had to work very hard at it. And today, everyone's enjoying the spoils. And also, in a way, validating the tough decisions we took. Yeah. So, yeah, tough times means tough decisions. It also means better companies will survive. It also means weaker companies will, you know, actually, sadly, just, just disappear. And I've seen that happen now in four or five cycles. So early days, 2001, 9-11 happened. Mm -hmm. Like you said, Mehek, US, India was our business. 9-11, right. people didn't want to get onto a plane. Right. I mean, many of you, I guess many of you weren't born. Uh, 2001, uh, who all was born in 2001 no besides one. the first row? Just about, right? But you don't remember 2001, hopefully. So very, very early days. 9-11 changed the world of travel. People didn't want to get onto a plane for several months. And our business was entirely US, India. Right. SARS epidemic happened then and SARS for those who are the kind of quizzards or the, uh, you know, kind of uh, in, enjoy trivia, SARS was the forefather of, of COVID actually. That was the first time it yes. happened and people from the, the Far East that largely impacted the Far East, people started wearing masks way back then. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, dot-com bust happened. So no one wanted to fund a company like us. So it was a terrible time. It was a triple whammy. We made us tough. We somehow went through those crazy days. Very easy to give up, very easy to go back to a corporate job. Toughest thing to do in a very difficult time is to carry on. Yes. And so that's the lesson I learned. So after that, all crises never seemed that crazy or uh, that existentialism. Mm. That For us, that was an exist existentialism Absolutely. crisis. Mm. And if you go through that once, then you say, listen, how bad can this be? We have money in the bank. That time we had no money in the bank. <laughs> right. We had enough. And you know, you've been an entrepreneur. We had enough money for two months of survival. Mm. So mm. each each month you really took stock and you said, should we carry on? Should mm. we just pay everyone one, two months and say, mm. okay, thank you very much. Or should we give it a fight? And only two things uh, probably I'm preempting some of your questions. <laughs> Only two things work at that point of time. One is your left brain, which is your attention to metrics and numbers. And metrics and numbers, especially if you really go down to the very core ones, and the very core ones, you have a room named after one of them, which I really like, which was cost of customer acquisition, which is key in all businesses. Probably one, you should also have one called repeat rate because I think repeat rate doesn't get the, the, the glory it should. I think repeat rate is the most important metric in most of our business, at least in my kind of business. Probably in yours it's harder because, but your repeat rate would be more in terms of employers, right? Once you get someone who's an employer, why should they ever go away? They would only go away if they didn't like the people who joined from here. But if you've done a good job, like I always say, it's okay to incentivize your first time trial. So it's okay to induce trial and say, come and try us out for the first time. We have a new feature or we are a new brand. But the next time people should stay because they had a good experience. People should not stay because you keep giving them discounts. Otherwise you're in a poor business. At the minimum, you should reduce the discount. 
So I think that becomes a very important metric. So your left side of the brain is always looking at the right metrics, cost of customer acquisition, unit economics, which is obviously so important. It was nothing. Today we call it unit economics. It is basically for every transaction, how much do you earn, how much do you spend, mm -hmm. and are you getting better month on month? It's very hard to improve sometimes week on week, but mm -hmm. month on month, are you moving in the right direction? And then the, the tougher thing is the right side of the brain, which is really fuzzy logic or what I call thinking from the gut. And this term thinking from the gut is very interesting. We all know this is the gut, right? The mm -hmm. stomach. You know where it comes from? And there's a very good book called The Clever Gut. 25% of the neurons that we have in our brain are there in our gut. One quarter of your brain is in your gut. So some of you are very brainy, your gut is also very brainy. So thinking from the gut actually is an instinct reaction. It comes from there. So that is something which only you can tell as a business leader or an entrepreneur who's sitting out there saying, do I feel good about this? Yeah. But you can't be asking yourself that question every day. Right. So we developed something what I call discipline and depression, which is every month we took stock. Yeah. And I told my two senior guys who stayed back with me and became rightfully became co-founders through the crisis. And I said, listen, if we are in, we are in for a month. Because the rest yeah. of the 19, we were just, I think we were 20, 24 people. So the rest of the 21 people are looking at us every day. And they're looking at our faces and saying, are these guys feeling good about the future or are their faces hanging low? Right. If your faces are hanging low, people are going to say, party's over and they'll right. be looking out and they'll be on Nokri.com saying, I'm out of here. That Obviously, is. that's human nature, right? Because they'll say, Kal kehenge ke kal paisa nahi hai, khatam ho gaya. Mm -hmm. And it was the truth. And so we always told people, listen, we are in it. We promise you we are in it. And, you know, I was drawing no salary for 18 months. Two of these guys took big cuts, I think 50, 70 percent cuts, converted that into stock for them, etc. And we were in it saying because we genuinely believed. And the third thing which was driving me, which I think, which I only realized much later was a fear of failure. Mm. So that fear of failure was something which I actually didn't realize it at that point of time. I'm being totally candid. But I had done an entrepreneurial thing in the past, which was a company called AMF Bowling, which was my second job. Right. Wasn't really my venture, but it was entrepreneurial. And that was a failure. Uh, but I tried four years, very hard to make it work. I think I learned uh, street smarts doing that. But if I failed again, uh, two dots would make a line hmm. and I wouldn't have the courage to try another venture. So for me, I think it was fear of failure. And I think for all of you budding entrepreneurs, which is what I think MU is about, getting business ready. And you can be entrepreneurs within a business, really, entrepreneurs. For all of you, it's a good thing to have. And it also stems from, I guess, some amount of self-esteem. Ego is a bad word, but self-esteem is not a bad word, but there's a fine line. Ego is a terrible thing to have in business. You need to have no ego at all because your business is the most important thing. You got to sometimes just, you know, swallow your pride, go talk to partners, you know, extend the olive branch. It doesn't matter because you have to do what's right for the business because right. people are following you. People are blindly following you and you can't lead them into just because of ego, you take the wrong decision. Mm. But self-esteem is very important because that self-esteem will drive you harder and harder to say, let's not do the easiest thing in a tough time, which is, shut shop. It's the easiest thing to do, but you'll never have the guts to come back again. So the toughest thing to do is say, let's eat this out a little longer. Let's eat this out a little longer. That actually stays one of my biggest regret that did I just give up too soon. So we'll talk about yeah, that we offline. Will. We'll talk about <laughs> but you're in a good place. I am. So, yeah, I agree. Yeah, I agree. So you're fine. I am fine. Um, you you mentioned and we do have LTV which is lifetime value so uh, we are we are there, telling our students there you go, that there you go, yeah. and referrals is very important for us because these students get more of their friends and true, family true, here true, and true. Uh, we have a lot of siblings already in our fourth cohort. Okay, yeah, that's a good way to measure it. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, you mentioned about some of the silent uh, vows deep. Uh, did you like? Are there other than the ones that you already mentioned, like you know um, the right brain, like look at, uh, the left brain, like look at the metrics and numbers, take the hard call. Um, like, you know, yeah. think in month yeah. to month. Are there other silent vows that you would want to? Yeah, quite, quite a few, I think. I think uh, one was, um, I guess it, it's not even silent, all of them. Some of them are actually very core kind of values, hmm. which you want to tell people when they join up front, uh, especially the senior folks, because I think uh, there's a direct correlation between culture of a company or an organization and the founder's values. Actually, in some sort of way, it's a manifestation of founders' values. I agree. But 
a good organization should be very open to being molded. So every time you make a hire, specific, you know, especially a senior hire, you should be quite open to saying, let the goodness that this new person is bringing into the company, the positive stuff that we don't have there, their little twist, let's also absorb that and let's also learn from that. Let's be very open. Let's not be rigid, especially young organizations. And I, I you know, I treat us as a 23-year-old startup. Mm. And so we are very open to if someone's bringing a good idea and also a good new way of working right. from wherever else. That person could have worked somewhere else. The person could have dreamt it up. And normally it comes from very young people. But then you've got to be the kind of organization which is very open to that and saying, yeah, you know, why don't we look at this? So I think we say up front that, listen, the best ideas can come from anyone. Hmm. really don't be scared to come up with them. The day we become a company where people are afraid to speak their mind is the beginning of the end. So I have been uh, embarrassed at many board meetings by my own colleagues. And it's very tough to take initially, right? Because, you know, you're meant to be the founder, the CEO, whatever. But if there's merit in it, it's a good thing. And your board member sitting out there, Sanjeev used to be at my board at one time. Now he's on the advisory board when we went public. You know, he chose to step down, etc. So, if you can actually develop a way of saying, okay, let's evaluate that. And again, it comes down to not having ego. Mm. Because the moment you have ego, you say, how can someone else have a better idea than me, right? But you say, hey, maybe there's something in that. Mm. Now, ideally, that should have been discussed before the board. But you have to give the benefit of the doubt to the individual. Maybe something just sparked it off at the board. Maybe you had a nice, and we used to have wonderful board meetings earlier, which were brainstorms. Now we have the regulatory post listing. You do very different kind of board meetings, and you know they're just like regulatory. Mm. But the real board meetings are brainstorms, and they can't be done in one hour. Very often they're one day of you know an offsite. You get great ideas, so mm. something could have got sparked off by that, and that's why that individual in your senior team spoke up at that point of time. You've got to accept that. Right. The message that sends to the rest of the organization is just, you know, it's it's worth its weight in gold. Because the next person says, oh, wow, it's perfectly okay to, st to mm. say what I feel, which doesn't happen in most companies. I can tell you I've worked in two very large companies, G Capital and ABN AMRO, and I think you have to be careful of when, how you said what. Right. So, you know, say it with politeness, but we tell people don't bother about couching it too much, don't bother about fancy presentations, because if we lose the power of the idea coming from a youngster, who typically is much closer to our customer than we ever will be. Mm. Everyone's not like Pratham, who's in touch with the customer. You know, we get we get further and further away, and we have to do focus group discussions. Or you know, I I love doing customer labs, mm. and the reason I love doing customer labs is uh, twofold. One is I learn more on that day than on any other day, wow. which is sitting in on eight interviews, sometimes nine, one hour long interviews, sitting in the other room a moderator, a professional moderator, interviewing the person, that person selected by a cohort like mm. what we have designed. I want to meet someone who buys flights from us but not hotels. Mm. I want to meet someone who buys next week hotels from us but not homestays. I want to meet someone who buys homestays from Airbnb but not from us. And we do all of that and I love designing that and meeting. So I go one to learn. And we're sitting in the other room and the moderator comes out halfway and say anything else. And we paid the person to come here. They don't know they're coming for this company, but they're paid well for their time, etc. And uh, they know that they're being recorded and listened to. The second reason I do it is because if I go, others go. And others take I it agree. seriously. <laughs> Product managers don't take it seriously. <clears throat> and the beginning of the end is when you feel like I know my customer. Mm -hmm. Today in India, it is impossible to know your customer irrespective of what you do. If right now I was to take a guess, of where which where which kind of school you guys have come from uh, where you belong to uh, which city you've come from also socio eco profile etc i think i would get you know 20 out of 100 i would fail and i play this game with myself all the time when i'm on a flight mm -hmm. i love talking to strangers because that's our business uh, my wife is annoyed by that because <laughs> you know she says you're crazy you can do that but i, I genuinely enjoy it and I like to guess and, you know, my, my kids enjoy that and we'll first guess where is the person from and, you know, more about the person and then go approach the person. Mm -hmm. But I like to get travel habits and I like to understand where they're from. And yes, I run the risk of them saying, Mera refund phasa hua hai, that's okay. <laughs> but I need to know because only when I know will, you know, it serves many purposes. But 
you today do not know your customer. So when a product manager says, yeah, 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 I know what I'm building and this is the feature and all, have you spoken to the customer? I've spoken to five people who, the five buddies you go out drinking with, but they are like you. The customer is very different today. Mm. And I am amazed who is filling up our hotels and who's filling up our flights. Because of the same thing we spoke about in the beginning, trickle down. Mm. $2,000 per capita income is racing to $6,000. Right. But they're not the people necessarily buying from us. People are buying from us who are today in C and D towns who have so much money that they don't know what to do with it. Mm. They just need the opportunity. And, you know, I maybe you guys are aware of this and, you know, you have a background Punjab, but people come down regularly to Delhi for the weekend, stay across the road, stay at Oberoi's, they come only to shop. Very rich, yes. they'll come in their Mercs and BMWs, they will be shopping, you talk to Emporio, and Emporio Mall is alive today only because of the largest of B and C towns, hmm. not A towns, because A town guys are going overseas and they don't want to buy what's available at Emporio, because then their friend also has it, etc. And all of, we won't go into that kind of marketing, that's a different thing. But people are coming from B and C town because there's so much money today, but they don't know where to spend it. Mm -hmm. And luckily for us, youngsters have basically declared and decided that they travel is right on top of their list. Mm -hmm. Experiences of which travel is very important. It didn't happen when we were growing up. Right. Most of us growing up, and I grew up in a good middle class. My dad was in the private sector. My mom was a teacher. We did one holiday a year, and very often it was a driving holiday. And we went up to the hills and it was great fun and we would go for one week or two weeks. Sometimes it was Shimla, sometimes Masuri, sometimes Nenital. That was the holiday. The second holiday in the year was either to your Bhua's house or vice versa or Nani's house. And that was your holiday and with right. your cousins. That was typical. And in fact, that was very good. Simple. A lot of people didn't have that. When, you know, I remember when we got married, uh, even before we had kids, we said, okay, listen, we will, you know, our honeymoon would be overseas. It was unheard of. Time's up. No, no. Okay. <laughs> I don't know why this time. Okay. Uh, that's fine too. <laughs> I'm so sorry. So we would, we would typically go, you know, we said honeymoon will be overseas and that was a big deal at that point of time. I had a banking job so I could afford it and we, you know, we went to, I remember Lankavi, we counted our pennies, but we went overseas. And then, uh, you know, in winter we said, or in summer we said, we'll go somewhere else. So mm. two holidays. Kids came along and we started saying, let's go for a couple mm. of more, a couple of more. Right. And suddenly now, People are going for as many as possible. My my favorite immersion interview was with, before you actually joined, Yash, was with this youngster. So I play a game saying, how many uh, weekend, how many trips did you make last year? So I'll start by saying more than five and people have their hands up and then more than 10. And one girl kept her hand up till I kept going 20, more than 20. Finally, I said, how many do you do? She says, every weekend last wow. year, she and her husband, every weekend, 52 weekends, double income, no kids. They went for a trip. So their deal was every Friday night, they will sit in a train mm. or they will, you know, if they can afford it, they'll fly or Saturday morning they'll drive and they'll come back straight Monday morning to work. So that's incredible. And they had seen, you know, parts of India I had not seen, which was embarrassing. <laughs> but that's what people are doing. That's an extreme. Mm. Mm. But the average now is about six, seven, eight breaks. And this is people who are joining us at, you know, starting salary. So it's not crazy. They're saying, you know, have have time will get away. So it's more about getting a break. It's not the money will figure out because they're not saving for a car. Sadly, many of you guys don't know how to drive, which is shocking. It's a, it's a life skill and self-driving cars will never work in India, let me tell you. Or will take a long, long time to work. I won't sit in one, I can right. tell you that. Uh, and they don't want to save for a house because they're saying, you know, renters economy. Yeah. And I have a brother who's 15 and a half years younger, very successful lawyer, mm. own firm in Bombay. He doesn't want to buy a house. Every time I meet him, I say, Karan, I think, you know, you should invest in a house now and more. He's saying, what's the point, Buy It's a waste. I mean, why would I do that? Mm. And I said, whatever. So it's a different generation, but different thinking. Um, that's, that's very insightful, Deep. Thanks for that. And I want to touch base on one of the things that you mentioned, which is about, uh, you know, a lot of uh, youngsters are now becoming very enthusiastic about travel, etc. And I'm sure as a leader, you would have a lot of leadership dilemmas where um, you have to service the interest of conflicting interest groups. So on one hand, you have your shareholders and all these travelers who really want you to maximize their profits, they want to maximize their travel, etc. But on the other side, you're also someone who is uh, uh, who's very careful about the environment. You're, you're the founder of one of the NGOs, I'm Gurgaon. So how do you balance a sustainable growth uh, so that you know catastrophes like the ones that we are seeing in smaller yeah. towns, which yeah. are over-traveled, does not happen. 
Yeah, it's a great question, Mike. Really, thank you for asking that. So it's it's not easy. I think you can do it only. You can have the liberty of doing these things when you scale up and mature as a company. Mm -hmm. Did we think about CSR in the early days? No. Uh, did we go and work with NGOs in the early days? Yes, but only with time. Mm -hmm. So there's an NGO we started working with, which is as old as us. Or it was there earlier called Udayan Care. They've literally grown with us. We had no money to give them in the early days. But every Sunday, many of us would go and spend two hours teaching the kids there. They were largely orphan children and they've grown with us. We have hired girls from Udayan Care and it's an amazing partnership. But about, I think 10 years ago, we got really serious about it. Uh, you know, I think the longer we thought uh, about which area to work on, it was clearly sustainability. Uh, I always say there's only one negative of travel. Anyone wants to guess what? Sorry about this side, guys, uh, but you can see a much prettier face than mine. So. What, what is the negative of travel? Carbon footprint, right? Yeah. That's probably the only negative, which is willy-nilly, there's a carbon footprint. You can't really travel and not have a carbon footprint mm -hmm. unless you do this ultimate walking, cycling tour, or you're like that guy who is our, uh, you know, Forrest Gump of India, the mm -hmm. Lal Singh Chadda, whatever, so you're, you're just running. But no, by and large, we will travel, we'll take a mode of travel, we'll stay in a hotel, we'll use up, you know, uh, soaps and detergents, those sheets will get cleaned uh, every day, the towels, etc. All those things that happen. So there's a carbon footprint. More than that, for India, uh, we have to realize that our ecosystem is very fragile because we have over time overcrowded, and the, there's a concept of over tourism. Over tourism has denuded most of our hills. Mm. And that is why what just happened in Himachal and Uttarakhand. Why it's happened with such severity is because over time there's been deforestation. So the soil cover has actually become eroded and there's a runoff which happens and we've allowed people to build right next to the river. There's a problem. And we don't, uh, you know, um, we don't have laws which come down heavily enough. So basically you go to a small town, you go to Manali. Manali was my favorite hill station in India for the longest time. I was just pristine and beautiful. I went back to Manali in 2019 for my closest friend's 50th birthday. He's married to a girl from Manali and we went there. He said, you have to come here, etc. And we went in June when his birthday was. I wanted to cry. I wrote about it. It was published in Times of India. I wanted to cry because I saw firsthand what we had done to Manali, exactly what we had done to Shimla and Nenital and Masuri. These are places we have ruined forever. It's very hard to bring them back because we've taken away the forest cover. We have the, the river, all along the river, we have allowed, you know, shops to come up and restaurants to come up and basically a little bit of flooding and they're all washed away and we lose lives and we lose. So this, we cannot let it happen to other places. And that's where guys like us have to step in. Yeah. Uh, you know, we have decent amount to give ourselves. But what we've been really excited to see is how many travelers, people like you, are willing to give that five and ten rupees every time you book a ticket or you book yes. a hotel room. It's amazing. You know, that number, if it's pre-checked, is very high. Mm. I can't get, but if it's even unchecked, mm. we're talking about 17-18%. Wow. 17-18% of people positively say, yes, I will give 5 and 10 rupees each time. Trust us enough that this is going to MMT Foundation, which is working with organizations like Seva Mandir planting trees. We've done now 1.8 million. We're getting close to 2 million trees uh, in different parts, but with partners. Mm. In Andamans, we have tried to rid one entire island, Neil Island, which is smaller than Havelock, of single-use plastic. And we're working with the government saying, uh, we built three water ATMs. We got Tata Chemicals to come and do it. The groundwater there is pretty clean. We give reusable bottles to all our travelers. Wow. And we sell them very cheap to anyone else going to Neil Island. So you can get water at one rupee from a water ATM, which is run by an Adivasi woman. Mm -hmm. They also clean toilets out there and shower facilities and, and changing facilities which, you know, women need if they want to enjoy the beach. So it's a very nice integrated model doing well. And the government has reciprocated by banning lower than one litre size bottle, a mm. single use plastic. We want all to go. They feel we are not ready yet. And next we want to move to Havelock. And then finally we want to move to Port Blair. And the goal is to make the entire archipelago of Andamans and Nicobar single use plastic free. You just have to look at what's happening in the oceans. The ocean, that's true, what we see on those, you know, Nas Daily mm. or the other guys, they mm. keep sharing. We have islands of plastic now. Mm. We're trying to do something very big in Goa with the government now. And so we've taken it upon ourselves to really look at sustainable travel as the only future. 
Otherwise, my big fear is anyone with money, and I tell this to the tourism minister and the tourism secretary, and they don't like hearing it, anyone with money will go overseas, mm. will stop traveling in India, except to very uh, remote places. People, all of you, the moment you have money, you'll say, listen, four-hour flight, I'm going to Phuket to party, I don't want to go to Goa, I've been too often. But the reality is not that Goa you've been too often, Goa is becoming dirty. Yeah. North Goa is no fun any longer. People are saying, okay, I'll go either far, far north mm. or I'll go down south. Otherwise, families don't want to go to Goa. You can't, you can't go and enjoy yourself on the beach. And that is a different problem with our psyche. And, you know, if women are in swimsuits, they'll feel uncomfortable. If you're with your, you know, wife or your daughter, they can't really enjoy the beach because of, you know, various other things. So we have other problems. Some of them can't change. But what we can change, we are very committed to working on. That is, uh, yeah, that so is I'm very, very passionate. To hear. So my partial executive, I spend a lot of my time on the foundation. That is really yeah. relieving to hear more yeah. than anything else, Deep. Um, Deep, and this question is for my students here. Uh, a lot of students, they would say that, you know, all the obvious ideas, all the easy ideas, a lot of them have been They're all built. gone. They're all gone. Uh, what are four or five of your favorite ideas that you can share that, you know, or how should students ideate uh, yeah, one yeah. of those if you can help students think about it? Okay. Yeah, sure. I think, I think you know, like you rightfully said, Mehek, I was there in the early days of internet in India. Mm. And, you know, uh, online travel for me was kind of a no-brainer. I just looked at businesses which were being done on the phone mm. and I figured they'll move online. So I had two plans, online stockbroking, online travel. And I believe both of those will move very quickly online. So in a way, it was an easier time. Uh, but... In many sort of ways, it was also a tough of time course. because, you know, uh, getting 2 million funding was probably tougher than getting uh, 50 or 100 million today. Yes. So it was tougher also to convince high quality people to give up their jobs and to come to work for something which was crazy. I mean, dot com was a bad word till I think 2010, 11, really it started changing. Mm. Till that time, dot com people said, Kyu aur koi nokri nahi mili? Mm. Truly, I, I you know, I, I, I went to a quiz, a corporate quiz called, I think, Brand Equity and Derek O'Brien, who's become a friend now, was the quiz master. Big Hall Kamani or somewhere we were sitting and he was calling out the names of the companies and he called out, make my trip and he started laughing. He said, what do you guys do, sell marijuana? <laughs> and I remind him of that all the time. I said, yeah, whatever. And he says, and you afforded 5,000 rupees to take part in the quiz. That's amazing. You had 5,000 rupees. Like he was really ridiculing us. We made it to the final. We were on the top six. He, uh, you know, took his words back. But it was a tough time to be. Uh, today, what has happened, guys, is particularly over the last year, I kid you not, but I believe AI has opened up a new realm of possibilities which is as big as two other big things in the past. So PCs in you know, early 90s, etc. first time computing power PCs, and then mobile and computing power smartphones. I, I'm really telling you, AI is going to change the game in ways which none of us can fathom. So of course, we read all the you know, kind of books, our articles, more, you listen to the podcast, it's great, you must. But what all that's going to impact and how you can build myriads of business basis it mm. if you have a little bit tech bent of mind. You don't have to be a coder. I can't code. My, the only coding I learned was uh, basic in, in, in school and then I went to NIT course. I love to challenge my guys with flowcharts, mm. but I can't code and it's a limitation. I wish I did and one of my few regrets in life is giving up Bitspilani, Tripoli and uh, doing eco and mm. who knows, life could have been different. But if you have a little bit of a tech brain, which is you largely, you can think logically, you can break down problems into small pieces, uh, you can build businesses on AI itself. That being said, the opportunity you have today, even in the offline world, mm. I don't think Masters Union would have been possible even 10 years ago to take off like this. Because today there are so many households who have the money to afford something like this and to say we want to send our kid here to change their life because they've realized that UPSC is a gamble and IITs and IIMs, especially IITs, the four-year quota thing is not meant for everyone. It's really, really hard. Today when a city kid, actually my CHRO son, the city kid from Noida got into IIT Mumbai on his own merit and said, wow, this is incredible. For a city kid to get into IIT today is very hard because you're competing with someone whose entire life mm. and focus for four years is to get into IIT. It's very, very hard, as we know. But what you can do today is build businesses for the burgeoning Indian middle class who are ready to afford the kind of things which you are seeing around. 
these will go into tier 2, tier 3 very, very quickly. So you can build many businesses because you're experiencing them today. Some of you are from B and C towns. You can see the gap in the market. You can build offline businesses which can work out there, which most people won't understand. So you play to your strengths is what I would say. Play to something which you're innately good at. Your chances of success just went up 10x. Every time you try to get into something which you're not good at, you're A, going to labor through it. You're not going to enjoy it. And your chances of success are going to come down you know, by 90%. Everyone has strengths and you know what they are. We all fall into the trap of saying, oh, let's just do, get into the biggest, highest salaries. Where are the highest salaries? They're probably in finance and in consulting. But maybe that's not meant for you and that's perfectly okay. It took me a while, three years to realize banking's not meant for me. People who loved banking are doing very well, but I wasn't loving banking. So the most important thing to do is to figure out what makes you tick. And think about this long and hard. If you take one thing away from this talk, just take away this thing which you have to think about when you're alone and you have a lot of time, what makes you tick? Which is, what do you get excited about? Which, unsurprisingly, will be very close in tandem with what you're good at. Figure out what you're good at, whether it's marketing, whether it's finance, whether it's stats, numbers, math, whatever it is. Something you're good at and you're better than most people. You're in the top 10%. And just work on that. These are the days of super specialization. Gone are the days of being a generalist. Mm. In my time, we had to be generalists. We had to be good in everything. You don't. You have to be very, very, very good in just one thing. And it could be anything. And I, I really mean it. Once you find that, success will, for you will be much easier. And you'll have to think hard about it. It could be a very small thing. It could be listening to people and understanding their trouble. Maybe you'll build something around the whole counseling side of the business, which is becoming huge. Mental health in India has just been ignored till now. It's just starting off. Mm. I didn't know what was mental health. Mm. I've learned mental health only through my kids and their friends. And it's huge and we need to be aware of it, but mm. we weren't aware of it. So figure out something which you truly love and build whatever your career around that. I can assure you, your chances of success will go up much more. But if you fall into the trap of just saying, I want to go where the biggest money is, mm. I want to go where this is, I want to go this is, you might just keep struggling and you'll never, you know, because for some people that came naturally and they'll always be ahead and you'll be wondering, you know, why I'm not doing that. So figure that out and uh, life and build your career around it, whether it's working for someone or doing your own thing. I learned a bit about your course structure and I wish I could study like this where I was actually building a business uh, every term. I was building a new business. My God, that would be incredible. I would definitely be very sure. I won't waste my time, maybe eight years of my corporate life. I would have started to make my trip way back in 2000 and not waited till, uh, or rather 92 and not waited till 2000. So, Absolutely. Yeah. I think this is Startup 101, a masterclass right here. So thanks for sharing that, Deep. And I have a lot more questions, but I want to keep it open for the audience. Before that, we have a very short, exciting trivia for you. Sure. Uh, so why don't we put that up? Uh, so you have to guess some of these places and uh, wow. we have tried okay. to keep some places which were yeah, your the, favorites. Uh, okay, the first one uh, that looks a lot like Humpy, uh, I hope it's correct. And the second one, wow, which monument? No uh, stress, uh, no pressure. <laughs> no pressure, man. I love what you're doing. But the second one could well be some part of, it's not Humayu's tomb. Okay, I'll go with Umayyus tomb, but it's not. I mean, I know the period of architecture, Mughal, it's where it is. It's th that time, but maybe I'm wrong. Okay, Audience first one, Zampi. Anyone? The left one? Ellora Ridge, Ridge Road. Wow, which monument is this? Should have known that. Monta, that Ponta Sahib or something. Is that Ponta? Oh, I should have known that. Yeah. Okay. Ellora, I didn't know. I've been there, but I, I look like Ampi. Beautiful. Okay, the more to embarrass one. me? Just yeah. the last one. Okay. Okay, next one, please. Which hotel? Uh, this looks like the Umed Bhavan Palace, not the Imperial. Is it the Imperial? No. It could be Umed Bhavan or second is Statue of Unity. If I didn't get that, Modi ji will throw me out of the time. <laughs> oh, it's not. You want to take the audience poll, Deep? <laughs> oh, no, that's not Statue of Unity. No, 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 that's a Buddha statue. Yeah. Yeah. Thoda zoom in kar do, yeah. In the middle of a lake. No idea. Well, the first one I'll go with uh, 
Actually, I won't even go with Imperial. No, that might be the new Raffles in Udaipur. Okay, I'll go with Raffles in Udaipur. Okay, answers please. That is Taj Falaknam. I've stayed there. <laughs> Okay, second this is, is clearly not a great idea. Embarrassing. And you know the worst part about the second? Hussain Sagar is in Hyderabad. Yeah. I'm Hyderabad born. Yeah. <laughs> we'll try to keep it simple looking at your birth history. I was more over it. Beautiful. Well, I, you know, definitely your last four slides were really good. Your second one I'm going to challenge with too. Well done. Well awesome. Done. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We'll open it up for the audience It's questions. a good idea for immersion. Yeah. This is what we should do for people. Yeah. Okay. All right, so uh, if we can have the mics uh, for, uh, okay, we're ready. Uh, we can put our hands up so we know uh, who wants to ask a question. Right there. Hi, uh, Hi. This question is regarding your listing. Um, what made you list in NASDAQ in 2010 and versus the questions from Dalal Street, if Make My Trip were to list today, would Dalal Street be the way to go? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question. So in two, what's your name? Madhav. Madhav. So, Madhav, uh, and please sit here, relax. So, I, you know, way back in 2010, we did have a big uh, dilemma on this. So, one of the rare times our split was, our board was split down the middle. And Sanjeev was on the board at that point of time. In fact, Sanjeev is the one who told us as early as Jan, it was the January board meeting of 2010. He looked at our numbers and as you know, Sanjeev, he looked at them and suddenly he says, you guys are ready to list. And he speaks so fast. I said, what? He says, you're ready to list. And I said, are you serious? He's saying, yeah, on the board. So everyone, all the investors, everyone was normally pretty bored. They, they all woke up, oh, really? The company is ready to list? I had no clue that we were ready. He's saying, yeah, we were this size when we listed and you should list by next year, whatever. So then it was US versus India because in India, they were the only listed.com, which was InfoEdge. And in US, there were at least 50 listed.coms, including many from overseas. And remember, uh, we still had at least 15% of our business come US, India. And we had good numbers. That time we were 400 million top line, about 40 million revenues, going to 60 million, growing at about 50%. So we we're going quite well. And um, clearly, the international investors wanted us. Uh, we had Tiger, who had a, uh, they had a, Tiger Global didn't have a board seat. They had, uh, what are they called, visitor rights or, uh, board invitee. Mm. Uh, we had Safe Partners, who was our first investor, and we had Sierra. They all wanted US, Helion, and I think Sanjeev. So both the Sanjeevs were very keen on India. And I had some independence, and we were all pretty confused. So the discussion went nowhere. I said, guys, give me a week. I'll come back in a week. So I actually, and I go to first principles. If I don't know something, I have no shame in admitting I don't know. So I said, give me a week. And I used that week to talk to about 10 people who had experience in both listings. And I reached out to people I didn't know. Uh, and they were very kind with their time. I remember reaching out to Nandan Nilkeni. We had nothing in common then. Now I know him really well. I am A in common, but uh, the Infosys founders were very inspirational for me, the kind of company they had set up, role models. And he put me on to Mohandas Pai, who had, was the CFO, and he spoke to me. One of my classmates from Ahmedabad, Pulak Chandan Prasad, now Nalanda Capital, then Wabak Pinkus was on the board of Airtel. He had some experience. I spoke with uh, Ajit, uh, the Rediff.com, Ajit Balakrishna, Rediff.com. Spoke to various guys, a company called Onmobile, which doesn't exist, who had experience in both. And I came to the conclusion that, listen, uh, a US listing would be better for us because of the understanding of the model, the appreciation of the model, the depth of the market. That was then. I think it was the right thing to do. Tougher market, more expensive to do a listing there. Brutally, very brutal in terms of like, it cuts both ways. So like you do very well, you get rewarded very well. You do badly, you get harshly hit. Uh, Roadshows were very tough. For the first five years, every quarter, so 20 trips, we did roadshows, Rajesh and me. Rajesh was my CFO then, I was CEO. And very brutal because every day you're in a new city, nine, 10 meetings, then you go to the next city, like you sleep four hours a day and they're very tough. I can't even do it now physically. So, uh, but... The US, the India market, I think, last four or five years has definitely opened up uh, to, uh, you know, the internet stocks. There's an understanding. And we keep getting, obviously, bankers keep on saying, why don't you do it? So I think it's something we consider. I have to be very careful what I say. I get quoted all the time. Then uh, my CFO has to, uh, you know, battle all of this. So I think it's something we are open to considering. Uh, but are we working on it actively right now? No. I think now we're getting rewarded well there. Dual listing is also hard. So maybe at some point of time, uh, because there is big value of being listed in your home market. Now 99% of our business comes uh, from ex-India. Okay, now GCC has opened up. So maybe 95% comes from ex-India. So the brand recognition, etc. 
Also, we would like to do that because the other stocks which are in travel who are listed, then it's out there to see the difference in the model, not just the scale and size, but the profitability. And I think so, maybe at some point of time. Let's... Uh, so, uh, you mentioned that as an entrepreneur, you'll uh, like push to fail often and fail fast so that you can learn. So, like, how did you balance these two instincts within you and like over the years, how has the attitude changed towards? Yeah, it's, a, it's a great question. What's your name? Chaitanya. Chaitanya. Yeah, it's, it's again a fine line, Chaitanya. So one side you have that overarching fear of total failure, which is more like, you know, Mehak took a really hard decision some time back and said, I'm going to shut my business, which, you know, was obviously doing well. And for whatever reason, she took that call. I think that overall failure I'm talking about. But the small thing uh, like features, products, experiments, I think you've got to build a, a culture where it's okay to fail. And it's hard to say you celebrate it, but I can tell you even now when I attend like product meetings and if people have taken the right steps, they've taken people along, they said, we're going to do this. This is the potential downside. I need five to 10 lakhs of investment or one crore of investment, but here's the potential upside. This could happen. This could, that's the way to do it and to get sponsorship. That's all what sponsorship is, which is you get sponsorship from someone saying this is worth doing. And someone senior says, yeah, go ahead, you know, invest those 20 lakhs, 30 lakhs, which is typically resources. So normally the fight is not for marketing dollars. The fight is for getting tech resources. And that's all the fight is about. You go to tech and they'll say, our pipeline is so much. So you have to fight to get up. And you say, but this is exciting and this is here and now. I'll give you an example of a feature which actually is, built in, uh, is using data science and touching on AI, which is Fairlock. Now, Fairlock is something which is such a no-brainer. Customers love it, which is locking into a fair because it's a low price. If the price goes up, you'll still get the low price. If the price gets down, you'll get the advantage of the, the, the lower price. How you do that is by really modeling. You do extensive modeling and you say, this is what typically people, if we, if we take, it's the insurance fund, it's actuarial sciences. You take tiny, tiny, tiny premiums from a lot of people, but it becomes worth the while and you might fail. So in the middle, Fairlock was not a profitable feature at all for us, but we said we'll persist. We'll just keep learning and tweaking the model and making it better. So I think you've got to then take a leap of faith, but you've got to build a culture where people are comfortable coming up and saying, I want to build something crazy. Because again, the day we stop doing that, then the beginning of the end, people say, yeah, listen, there's no one, everything is hunky-dory, I'm getting my salary at the end of the month, but then we won't be, you know, an uh, innovative company any longer. Someone will come and eat our lunch. And there are enough people waiting to do that. So I think there is actually a lot of pressure when you're number one. And very soon, MU is going to hit that. You will get to that top 10 ranking. You will be up there. And then others will be emulating you and saying, now we'll cut price. That is the worst way to compete, but it's reality. Because when people raise a lot of money, they're saying, yeah, let's just throw in this thing. But that's the worst way to compete. You have to compete with the secret sauce is typically something which can't be replicated. Secret sauce is never discounting. Even for Amazon, which you can say is the cheapest place, or Walmart in the US is cheap. Their secret sauce is not discount or cheap pricing. Their secret sauce is under the hood. It's the back-end sourcing. It's the assortment. It's the logic. It's the throwing up the, the recommendation engine. That is secret sauce. That's typically under the hood. This comes from the automobile industry. So the best-looking car is not the best car. The best-looking car is typically what's in the engine. And that's why, you know, for the longest time, German cars had cracked that and people said German cars will last forever, etc. Tesla comes along and changed the whole game. Tesla is hardly a car. If you've driven a Tesla, it's like a video game. But it's, a, it's n like something like which has never been experienced. And that is why it's such a valuable company. So I think we have to think very hard on what is our secret sauce. And to your question, definitely allow a system where it's okay to fail. It's perfectly fine. In fact, people who have tried four or five different things get rewarded in different ways because they are the mini entrepreneurs you really want. And you should join companies. If you are one of those who likes experimenting, join companies which are saying it's perfectly okay. Large companies, that becomes hard. That becomes pretty hard. Good afternoon, sir. Yeah, where are you? Okay. So, Avantika, this side. Um, so, I have seen Make My Trip ads getting involved every year. Mm. So how did you choose Ali and Ranveer as your face and what impact did it have on your customers? Like, how was their reaction? How did we choose whom, sir? Ali and Ranveer. Oh, Ali and Ranveer? Okay. Yeah, no, I think it, uh, by the way, it took a long, long time for me to get convinced to use celebrities. I was, all our ads were actually till we got Ranveer and Alia. And knock on wood, we've got very lucky with them. We've renewed them. First time they were, by the way, paired together. And they haven't forgotten that. 
I remember meeting these guys at the premiere of Gully Boy in Delhi. And the first thing Ranveer said was, but first time, bro, uh, was make my trip. So the guy is unbelievable. We just got very lucky with them. But to go to a celebrity, I think how I got convinced by my CMO and marketing agency. Marketing agency just wanted to spend more money because they make more money. But CMO's point was that, listen, we are now going beyond just air tickets. We are not being able to drill into people's mind that we do hotels. We need a powerful, a celebrity voice to say that. And then we started looking at many pairs and many individuals. And I think we took a leap of faith. I can't tell you there was any great science. That is the gut, where you just take a leap of faith. And I actually, I think I trusted my CMO then, who's now our head of, actually, he's our CBO for our flights business and our GCC business. And it was Sojanya's, I think, brilliance. And he had worked together with these guys or various stars in, uh, in Pepsi. And, uh, you know, I love it when someone says, uh, and that's what he told me and Rajesh then. He said, trust me, Deep, this will work. And I love hearing that. When someone says, trust me, because I'm the most gullible, trusting guy, I will trust you. But I'll come, you know, I, I, I'll i come and get your throat if it doesn't work. But it takes conviction to say, trust me. Hmm. You know, how many people out there say, trust me, this will work? Because they are putting their reputation on it and saying, I will make this work. And I love hearing that when people can say, and therefore, if I tell someone, trust me, the person also says, yeah, listen, this guy is putting his neck, his reputation on the line. So that's how it worked out. Worked out very well. We have a surprise in store for you, which we will, uh, for one of our other brands, with another very interesting star. Uh, and then we keep trying funky things like the fans ad, uh, which apparently work really well because friends of mine have called me for homestays. They're doing, like, I have crazy friends, cricket crazy friends who are doing every match. And they don't have any, they bought the match tickets. They don't have air tickets, they don't have places to stay. I said, you are Einstein, you are the IM Ahmedabad. So he said, you are now, you have seen your ad too. Now you have homestays, now you, have home stays, now you get us this thing. So people are working on getting them things. But uh, that was a clutter breaker. I think that worked really well. So we are looking at different clutter breaking thing, but we have another very interesting uh, brand ambassador coming up. And uh, I'm pretty excited about what uh, she has done for us. So let's see. Okay, let's see. Uh, can we take a question from there? But one point on that. Sorry, I missed your name. So the risk of a celebrity is always, uh, and that was my question to the agency. What if the celebrity tomorrow does something mm -hmm. which goes against our brand ethos? Yes. And that's why we, I rejected a lot of sports people because in sports people, this country is very harsh on them. Mm -hmm. One bad, you know, uh, series and we say, Are, ho gaya banda, ye ho gaya. Well, also injury, right? Mm -hmm. So I said we'd rather go for uh, movies, Bollywood, but also how can you vouch for character? You mm. can't, right? Tomorrow, scandal, things like that. So that was the risk and that kind of tilted us definitely towards Alia. Uh, she just seemed like the nicest person possible and she is really. She's unbelievably sweet and nice. I can't even tell you like well, what an amazing person. So we felt very comfy with her. With Ranveer, we took a risk, <laughs> a big risk. He's going to be listening to this. So far, so good. Uh, he's cool. We share a birthday. Oh, I think that's wow. fun, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. A lot of companies like Microsoft have uh, AI-powered engines now, and they are going to integrate Ping with a feature called "If today I want to plan a trip to go for five nights, and these are my requirements and these are my expectations, yeah, yeah, and yeah, yeah. get me the best bookings available." Yeah. And how would you compete? Like, make my trip. How would it rank? Because now there's no Google ad options that you can apply. And how would you rank in the in the person's choice, may it be of flights, of hotels, or other travel means? Yeah. No, it is a great question. So, eight, and what's your name? Uh, my name is Krish. Krish. You're from uh, UG or PG? These are UG students, just FYI. Lovely, lovely. Uh, which school are you from? Um, I'm from UK. Which one? Uh, I'm not from here, I'm from Kanpur. Lovely. So, uh, Krish, about uh, eight years ago, we invested in a company called Inspiroc. Before AI was even a thing, and Inspiroc was a travel planner built by two IITNs, both in the valley. Actually, one in Seattle, one in the valley. Two brilliant nerds. And I was blown away with what this engine could do. And they had built an engine which could plan a day. You just had to give where you want to go, uh, how many days, or what your budget was. And they'd build a full thing for you before AI. Uh, that company needed, we gave it as much capital as we could. And finally, it got bought by Klarna which is the big uh, book now, pay later kind of this thing in the heydays. 
uh, Klarna stock was at the peak. We also got paid in Klarna stock and then that crashed and all. AI is now doing all of that and challenging that. We already have out there something where you can speak to, not only in English, but in Hindi also. Uh, we're doing it for tickets right now. And you can just say, I have to go here and uh, place to go and purely this thing and we are suggesting things. What you described is something which we are very excitedly building. It's on the works. Are we building our own, uh, you know, large language model? No, we are building off it. We have a very close partnership actually with uh, Microsoft for that. But we want to build some core IP for travel, which is only with us. So we are already building something like this. In fact, I know Mahek would have loved to have asked me, what is the future and what are the challenges? That is the future, guys. No one is going to spend too much time on the actual planning, which otherwise is a very complicated thing, especially if it's a group. Uh, people are going to spend that time on actually enjoying the travel. And you're just going to be able to speak or give the basic parameters and you're going to get great options and few options, but customized for you. We will know what kind of travel Krish likes, what kind of budget Krish has, how it's different from what Mahek has, how it's different from what Pratham has, how it's different from what Deep has. And all of us will see for the same inputted parameters, verbally or by text, we'll see different results. So that is definitely the future and not the far away future, the very imminent future. And if we don't do it, someone else will do it. So we are very cognizant of that. And that is something which keeps me definitely paranoid. And I keep pushing my guys, like, what have we done on this? Baki sab to theek hai, what are we doing on this? Because that's the future, right? Why are you going to spend time uh, doing this? People should know you. Right? So many times I've gone there and shown them that I don't like flights before 8 a.m. I like flights after, preferably between 9 and 10. So many times I've told them if I'm flying Indigo, I want 13C or 13D. By now they should know that. That's my preferred seat because of extra leg room and reclining, etc. They know my meal preference. They know the kind of hotels I stay in. They know so much about me. They meaning us. Why can't they tailor a trip? Why would they ask me the same old question? They even know my kids' ages because of, you know, I've given it to them in the past. So recommendation, but very smart recommendation powered with AI is the future. Yeah. Great question. Please come and apply to us if you are interested. Yeah. He's in the first year, but yes. Oh, okay. Internships, why Internship. not? Internship. Internship. Okay, last question. Make it worth Deep's yeah. while. He, he's got. Yes. Uh, Hi, Alex. Yeah, sadly, Alex, not enough. You know, some state governments get it. But the sad thing about government is good people come and go. Actually, the saddest thing is that tourism is not, neither is it an industry of choice for people to work in. It's never been. And neither is it a sector of choice for the brightest IAS or ministers to get posted in. It's a sad reality. And it's always something which gets lip service. Uh, it's, it's one of those, uh, like you look at the tourism ministers, clearly people are clamoring for other things for different reasons. Also the secretaries. We have a phenomenal secretary right now, a new secretary, uh, Mrs. Vidyavati, really, really brilliant. And she gets it completely. I, I just hope she stays long enough. Also, center can't really impact states. Yeah. So we're working with state and center, but some states get it. MP has got tourism for the longest time and they've done a pretty good job of tourism. Kerala has always got tourism because they realize the direct connect with their exchequer, their, you know, how much they will earn. Rajasthan has pretty much got tourism. Besides that, most, most places don't get tourism. So they're still saying like tourism, Sair Sapata industry, hai, luxury. Ke this is the kind of stuff we come up against. So till people don't get it, forget at tourism level, at chief minister level, RPM definitely gets it, but he has many, many things to do. So people have to get it at chief minister level and make it mission critical to say that why will people keep coming back here? Same reason why I worry why people will keep coming back to make my trip. They come back for the experience, not just to see Elora once and say I'm not coming back. They come to one national park in uh, let's say MP and beautiful parks. We have Pench, we have Kana, we have uh, you know new ones coming up and I'll give you the names of some of them, Tipai, Tipeshwar, beautiful parks. People should want to keep coming back, right? They'll only come back if they had a great experience end to end, mm. which is landed somewhere, whether by plane or by train or by bus. 
good roads if they said to us you make it into us nice place to stop on the way to eat clean loose something as basic as that especially for women clean toilets along the way nice experience there went back you go and tell 10 people yeah you said it was amazing tiger to aap dekho gai wa because india has the tiger but was the whole experience nice sadly what happened six o'clock in the morning i went to gear forest the only place to see lion in india the experience is terrible yeah there are hundred jeeps there early morning there and they're giving money to get first in line and doing weird things the lions you see are actually uh, you know really starved lions i mean i sent a picture back of a lion i saw my friend wrote back i think it was just an overgrown dog yeah you saw not a lion it was very sad but the tigers are splendid mm. but you know the whole experience has to be end to end nice otherwise people don't go back a lot of people so uh, lots to do I wish I could say, uh, you know, I, I really wish I could uh, uh, change things at that level. And Alex actually leads our sustainability club, so we would love to nice. partner with Nikhil yeah. Trip in some ways. Uh, do read up what all we're doing. It's on our site, on our app, on uh, CSR. A pretty good amount of stuff, and we are very open to ideas. We are very happy to have internships there, and then also, yeah, uh, love to actually interact. We're doing a whole bunch of stuff there. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Uh, so thank right. you so much, Deep. This has been an inspiration. Thank you.